Other than that, then it's true again. I find it quite humorous that I was given the most awkward talk, and I am the most awkward talker. So I'm going to try and keep it short, okay? Uh, I'm also going to try not to be trivial or flippant, because I know that actually this is kind of a serious issue which a lot of people struggle with. Uh, but it's actually a big area, it's different for everybody, and there's a lot of people who will be listening who will be like bored or be patronised. That's not what I'm intending to do, but I'm intending to keep it simple and kind of honest. Also, I have a big caveat, which is that I am a man. And therefore... No. Yes, this is a <laughs> I'm going to say, not all men are like me. So, you know, like I said a minute ago, everyone's different. I am also different to all other men, and therefore... You're completely allowed to disagree with me, which normally people will always do, but you are specifically allowed to disagree with me. Normally you're not. Um, so let's all remember we're different and I'm particularly... <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean that that way. Uh, okay. Also, um, I'm going to try not to have too much discussion until at the very end, but it's the kind of thing that really we should talk about in our cell groups um, afterwards, so maybe we'll do some ideas for that. Uh, okay, my talk is split into three sections. I'm going to look at just three areas of sexual temptation which you might face. Then I want to talk about the sort of process or consequences of us going through those temptations. And then I'm going to look at some sort of methods for dealing with it. Um, but I'll try not to be judgmental because I know obviously this is something that from outside church people will often say Christians are very judgmental about sex stuff. So I don't want to try and sound like that, and I hope I don't end up sounding like that. But I am actually not an expert, so if I do, it's accidental. Temptation isn't itself actually wrong, because Jesus was tempted. I don't know what the next one is. Here we are. Um, Jesus was tempted, so the actual act of being tempted, there's nothing wrong with this. It's just, you know, kind of uh, how you act, after, how, what happens afterwards. But what is temptation? So, uh, and the Wikipedia has a nice summary of it. Not my talk didn't come from Wikipedia, but... Uh, uh, temptation is a desire to perform an action that one may enjoy immediately or in the short term, but that will probably later regret for various reasons. And then Wikipedia goes on to suggest that there's economic and social and political reasons. And then the last one on the list is religious. But this talk is religious, so... <laughs> hence Wikipedia is no good. <laughs> Temptation isn't something that you can satisfy. It's not something that, if you give into it, it's not going to come back. It's the kind of thing, if you give into it, it's just going to, you're just going to get worse at it. And it's just going to build up. It's never, you're never going to actually be satisfied if you give into it. Where does temptation come from? It comes from within us, which, uh, which is annoying. <laughs> From, uh, from out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. Sexual immorality there, uh, I deliberately didn't make bold sexual, but I did make bold the word immorality. <coughs> the word immorality there is, the Greek word is actually porneia. So the word porn is involved in the word, in the, in the biblical meaning of immorality. Uh, we'll come to that. Uh, in some cases, it's like a deliberate, willful thing. We deliberately want to do something that we know is wrong. But other times, it's kind of accidental or hormonal, perhaps. I don't know. And you don't make any effort to stop it. You have kind of your hormones can be quite kind of powerful, can't they? Uh, that's kind of the point. Of them. Uh, it can also happen from like being in a situation. So perhaps you're, uh, I don't know, you're out on a Saturday night on Bridge Street or whatever. You've had too much to drink. That kind of situation, you're more likely to be tempted, I suppose, depending on the friends you're with. That also, and also just generally, the friends that you're with can have a big impact on your kind of, especially your attitude to it. Actually, uh, there's also kind of innocuous sources, so like TV or movies, music, billboards or internet advertising. Sex is just all around us all the time. They reckon it's like 14,000 times a year or something you'll be advertised at, where sex is the, the thing they're using to sell it to you. Which is a massive amount, I can't remember what that was per day, but it's a huge number. Um, so we're just constantly being bombarded with it. And it's just, you know, obviously it's just going to settle in our minds. So we need to try and remember that this is kind of 
like a spiritual battle that we are in with this all types of temptation, but uh, I'm not talking about any other type of temptation. Uh, okay, so some areas of sexual temptation. Now, if we spent long enough, I could just ask you to suggest some areas of sexual temptation. But if I did that, you'd probably it, nobody would say any bad things because they knew that if they did, everyone else would say. <gasps> <laughs> So we won't do that, and also we probably come up with a really long list. Uh, I've just chosen three uh, areas for sexual temptation. I've called them looking too closely, heavy petting, and porn. <laughs> so the first area we, <laughs> we might look at is, we will look at, is uh, looking too closely. So what do I mean by looking too closely? What, what I mean is, what happens when you observe that someone yeah. is attractive, but then you sort of do more than just observe. You know what I mean? You kind of stop and sort of observe. <laughs> uh, now there's nothing wrong with the initial observation, obviously, because that's just how we, you know, we observe that people are that's normal. Uh, that can happen just by accident. You could be, for example, watching a film and then a certain character stands out, uh, you know, and then they stand out a bit too much, pay too much attention. Or you could just be walking along, happily minding your own business, and then <laughs> that kind of thing. And it's not deliberate, but you sort of do it unintentionally. Do you, do you find people doing it unintentionally? I mean, it's kind of interesting actually, because if you're sitting in a cafe or something, or whatever, sitting in a public place, and you have people watching, and you see like a group of folks, and then a pretty lady walks past, you can watch them all just watch her and walk past. I do find it quite humorous. <laughs> but also, I kind of know that actually, if I was in the situation, I might also be doing that. So. Why do we do this? What are the reasons? Um, is it because we're just admiring them? Or do we fancy them? Or for a woman, do we feel that they're ruggedly handsome? <laughs> or if you're handsome? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean, anyway? What does it mean to say that somebody's good but not bad looking? Does it mean we kind of you know, when we look at them, do, do we, and we fancy them, when we say we fancy them, is that, you, like in the way you fancy a car, you kind of feel sort of some sort of possessiveness of it, you want that thing to be yours, so um, rather than actually wanting the best of them, you actually want them to be yours. So, you admire their body or the beauty or whatever, um, perhaps you want to be associated with that, perhaps you want them to be, kind of belong to you, because that will, in, you know, enrich your prestige, I don't know. Or maybe they look like the kind of person who will make you feel safer or protected or provided for or something, I don't know. Um, or if there's someone famous, like on TV or whatever, perhaps you want recognition of being desirable to somebody famous. I don't know. But this whole thing is just producing people to what they look like. Um, we don't know them, we don't have any idea who they are, or what their background is, and we just look at them and think, ah, an attractive person. Um, have you seen the film Shadow Hal? I've got quite a large paragraph here, but I'm going to summarise it by saying if you've seen the film Shadow Hal, you know what I'm talking about, otherwise you don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like dating websites. You know, you go on your dating websites, and there's people, people, you know, like, not at work, but whatever. And they kind of just click through profiles like, Oh, I don't like that one. Click. Oh, I don't like that one. Click. I don't like that one. I like that one. Save. It's just like going through on eBay or something, isn't it? Uh, and it's easy to kind of feel judgmental of it, but actually that's what we're all like, really. We all sort of grade people and say, oh, that person's a level three, good looking. And, uh, that's my own personal grading system. <laughs> What's that one, sir? Three. Three. <laughs> <laughs> You're on.
But um, Jesus says you shouldn't actually look at somebody with lust in your heart. Otherwise you will already be guilty of adultery. So uh, but that seems a bit unfair, I feel. But you know, this, you've heard it all a million times. Why does he say that? It's because he wants us to treat our neighbours as ourselves. That's the reason, isn't it? He wants us to treat them as we want to be treated. And that we don't want to be treated just on our looks. So we don't want to just be treated on our outward appearances. We want to be treated on who we are and we want to be respected. So we should be respecting other people. And if you are just concerned about looks, then it's kind of a kind of more worried, more shallow kind of I don't know. Not that I'm saying there's anything wrong with just being concerned about your appearance, but being worried about your appearance, there is something wrong. You shouldn't allow yourself to be worried about that because you're actually worth more than what you look like. Anyway, I'm labouring the point here, so let's move on. Another potential area for sin that a lot of Christians succumb to is heavy petting. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean kind of intimate contact, <laughs> <laughs> which some people will rank differently to others. For example, in India, if you're a bloke and you would meet another bloke as your friend, you would be quite happy to stand there shaking hands and you might walk along holding hands for a while. But when you first go to India, you think there's loads of gay people here. But it's not, they're just friends. However, women and men don't really shake hands at all. They don't have any contact. So the cultural difference there is, you know, that's, and it's the same amongst us, some people, for example, when I first came here, sorry to pick into this, this is just spot on, but when I first came here, I just used to shake everyone's hands because I used to shake everyone's hands. But now Ruth has trained me into embracing, <laughs> which I know you joke about. Bad Ruth. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> is <laughs> uh, Yeah, so it's a problem here that some couples actually have a real problem. They have this kind of boundary that they set, but then they keep stepping over it. And it's kind of like people saying, not a few weeks ago, we said it before, it's a good analogy about the cliff. So you kind of you see a cliff, which is this boundary that you put, you kind of want to get as close as you can to it, but actually you should try and stay as far away as you can from it, because once you go over it, you can't actually come back up it. I kind of like the analogy, but I prefer it if it was like a ski slope. <laughs> so you kind of see the ski slope, you start going down, oh no, I've stopped, what, what can I do? I can't stop. I have to fall over, which means I have to probably hurt myself, and I can go horizontally across it and get back onto a thing to go back up, so I can stop myself. Potentially, but it's difficult and painful. But anyway, that's just a. Okay, sweet. Thank you. Bye bye. Alright, I did like the analogy Anyway, you get other types of heavy petting. A lot of people who have been pretty good their whole lives, but then when they get into a relationship with someone who's got different values, or who's got like, a different belief system, uh, they've got different boundaries and they want to keep pushing your boundaries, and then you end up extending your boundaries. Or what about those people who've been going, for, going out for a long time and they're not, they're bored, they're running out of patience, they want, to, they want their relationship to move on to this next level, but they, they don't know how far it's too far. Um, I think as far as knowing how far it's too far, if you have to justify to yourself why you've gone not too far, or how far you've gone isn't far enough, or is too far, then you probably have gone too far. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote it down better than that, don't that. If you have to, have to ask yourself, or justify to yourself, why how far you've gone isn't too far, you probably have gone too far. For example, Bill Clinton. End of story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is the kind of uh, sexual temptation two, pe two people can feel. You might get one main instigator, but actually it takes two. So some sexual temptation, as we said, is, is personal, but um, sometimes it can happen when you're um, in a couple, and sometimes it can happen when you're not in a couple, it can just be when you're, you know, two people who aren't doing it. Um, it could be that you are tempted by somebody's parents who's um, trying to have an attractive appearance. Um, so, uh, this is an issue that I think men have with, with uh, it's more to do with the first step, actually, and I put it into the wrong part of my talk here, but, um, it's not just like women who are wearing like skimpy shirt, skirts or tight tops or different tight trousers or whatever. It could just be like a low cut top can be like, or just too much arms or whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> if, if you've got an Indian friend 
and you've got too much answer, and you won't have been used to that in India, and it will be. <laughs> but and we shouldn't be too worried about our appearance because we're trying to be somebody else at the same time. But we shouldn't be dressing to attract. So there's this 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 um, this line here. Um, there's a difference between dressing attractively and dressing to attract. Um, which brings me to my next point, which is that um, is it about form. And this guy, Dr. Al Mohler, who wrote this book, says that although men can be guilty of watching porn, women can be guilty of committing porn. Which I think is probably a bit strong to say, but you know, uh, it's not really particularly clear either, because it also says that men watch porn, which is not true. Uh, because something like, although 70, so the statistics are something along the lines of 70% of Christian men watch porn once a month, 30% of Christian women watch porn once a month. Which is a really shocking statistic, and I have an infographic, which would mean that there's probably like six or seven of us in this room who are not going to make you put up your hands, <laughs> you know? So if you are one of those people, you shouldn't be feeling, like, completely alone, or like you can't talk to other people, because there will be other people who have experience of this, and you won't know unless you do talk about it, but don't talk about it in front of everybody else, please. Um, the thing is about porn, it's so accessible. It's really, really accessible, right? Years ago, to get access to it, you'd have to go to like a dodgy shop in like a big overcoat and you'd get <laughs> shuffled in and shut out like, some happy wrapped in brown paper. Yeah. Now you can just get, <laughs> now you can just get your phone out. You know, you can just do it, like I said, at work. Um, I don't really need to talk too much about porn, I think, because we all kind of know quite a lot. Of, well, not too much about it, but all uh, So, there's two paths people tend to. I finished talking about the three kind of areas. There's sort of two paths people sort of tend to go down uh, when they realise there's a problem with sexual temptation. Um, on, the one, on the one hand, you get those people who think there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. They think that you know, not a problem, and they say, uh, yeah, I'm forgiven, I know that I'm forgiven, so I can do what I please because I don't have to worry about it. Well, those people have got, uh, I've got it all wrong, haven't they, because um, our relationship with God is kind of a valuable thing, <coughs> of using that relationship by acting that way. And we're actually becoming slaves to uh, our own desires, aren't we? On the other hand, you get those other people who say, oh no, I can't possibly let the situation continue, this is awful. I need ten rules, I need to throw my phone in the river, I need to get five accountability partners, and I need to go jogging twice a day, and so on. Those people have also got Christianity all wrong because they've been really legalistic, they're making up their own laws. Um, and a kind of way to look at this is to say that they're actually trying to add to the salvation that Jesus has already done. Because by trying to achieve your own arbitrary goals, you're trying to prove to God that you deserve the forgiveness that He's given you for free, which you didn't deserve. So you can't. So both legalism and indulgence in sin and prisoners. We are called to live a life of freedom from both. What is freedom? Freedom is not the absence of commitment, but the ability to choose and commit yourself to what is the best for you, according to you. How do you say his name? Paolo Chaylor, apparently, is the correct name. And indulgence might seem good for a while, but it's worth remembering that in 2 Peter, uh, he says a man is actually a slave to whatever is mastered him. Uh, it's a good story about this. Okay. There's this king from Belgium in some hundreds and hundreds of years ago called Reynold III, who was a really fat king. Really fat, okay? And hopeless. And his brother, Wilhelm, I think, came along one day and took over the throne, and rather than killing uh, Reynolds, he built a room around him with doors and windows and stuff in it, but didn't lock them, and he said he was free to leave any time he wanted. The problem was, Reynolds was so fat, he couldn't actually leave. His brother sent him food, loads and loads of really delicious food, every day. All Reynolds had to do to leave was to stop eating it, or just to sort of not indulge himself too much. 
Uh, and then he could have just walked out because he was have died and then he would have but he didn't. And he was actually in there for like 11 years until his brother was killed in the war, and then eventually they knocked down the building, got him out, and he died like six months afterwards because he was so fat and overweight and unhealthy and so on. So he sacrificed all his freedom for those momentary pleasures, even though they were like, oh, there's a plate of food here, I can, I can, I can just eat this one, I'll only eat this one, and then I'll be okay, I've already eaten more. But of course, it's not really like that, because in the end, you just keep indulging it. And keep indulging, you need to keep indulging it to stay where you are. So he sacrificed his reasons. On the other hand, you get those people who try and deliberately sacrifice their freedom through making up rules and regulations. So we're trying to make contracts with ourselves, uh, or with God, or whatever. But our hearts aren't in the right place because we're trying to find loopholes around it. Rachel Patchen's got a good one, which was that uh, when she and John were going out, the rule was uh, they always have to keep their feet on the floor. You do a lot, she says, with your feet on the floor. I'm assuming she's doing some sort of heavy petting. Ultimately, anyway, we can't do it on our own, but in his strength, we can. Uh, I'm sure if we've struggled with this, we've probably tried to keep these temptations, but uh, even if we're successful for a time, we actually end up failing and, uh, you know, trying to do it on our own isn't going to be successful, is it? So, I've created a flowchart. Alright, so, flowchart, this one on the, this sort of path on the, on the left here, it's kind of the, um, the sort of cycle of defeat, or whatever you want to call it. Like, if you get into this cycle, it's really, really, really hard to get out unless either a friend or something breaks you out of it, really. I mean, obviously, it's quite simple. Obviously, it's very, very simple. There's lots and lots of things involved. So, yeah. It's not perfect, but I think it kind of sums up quite a lot of the, situ the sort of system that goes on when doing this. I think this part, actually, I will talk about this, this bit here, this bit, unable to worship God. Who knows that um, if you feel guilty when you're in church, you can't worship God. Isn't that a funny thing? Because he's still the same. Um, I kind of noticed this one day, and I was like, why do I find it easier to worship you when I'm feeling okay and when I'm feeling bad? I think that's actually a trick of the devil's hand. That's actually... That's uh, some sort of shame, but why should it be like that? Well, uh, it's still the same, as I said, it's just a trick in our minds, and, uh, and yeah. you know, we need to bear in mind that actually uh, he has already paid the price for all of the sins that we have committed and he will commit. And that's the sort of mindset that we need to have. Um, if we we, we, kind of, we kind of think we need to ask for his forgiveness every time we sin, but we don't. We already did once, and that's it. He knew, when he forgave us, exactly what we were going to do in the future, and what we are still going to do. So if you go to church feeling really good and you feel like you can really worship him and everything, you should still be in that same kind of humble state that you are in when you feel really guilty, because uh, you actually, as I was just saying, you're still... You're still a sinner, you're still kind of so below him. Um, yeah. And you kind of need to bear in mind. Yeah, that. So that should kind of help you to worship him better when you feel better. And not worship him as badly when you feel worse. Um, yeah. He wants us to spend time with him and not exclude him from our lives because we don't feel worthy to spend time with him. And uh, this is summed up nicely in this hymn. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt of him, upward I look and see him there who made him before my sin. And he died once, and that was for all, for all the sins we did commit, for all the sins we will commit. And that's the point of once and for all, you know? Um, okay, so, coming to the last sort of one paragraph of my uh, talk, uh, Joshua Harris says this, 
We can't save ourselves, we can't change ourselves. Only faith in, faith in Christ can rescue us from the prison of our sin. Only the Spirit can transform us. Our job is just to invite His work, participate in it, submit in it. Submit in it and be humble in it. Yeah. Now we've got to the uh, very final stage here, which is discussing possible methods for uh, combating temptation. I've suggested a few uh, things here. Building resilience. Uh, how about regularly praying, regularly meeting, reading the Bible, memorizing it? Joshua Harris is saying that memorizing the Bible is a really good tool because actually the Bible is a sword. It's there to be used as a weapon. Uh, what we need to regularly attending church and accountability uh, and Christian friendships. So cell, cell groups and stuff like that. Really, really, really important to keep going to them and regularly keep going to them. Not just go to them one now and then. Um, keeping a track of what our good and bad relationships are. So if we are in relationships with people which aren't good for us, or our friends are, <coughs> keep making us go into situations which aren't good for us, perhaps we should think more about whether we should. Watching what we watch, watching what we eat. As I said about hormones, so if you keep eating like ginseng or whatever, you're going to have problems. <laughs> Finding out when you're vulnerable, and where I suppose you're vulnerable.